Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. So today we have great pleasure because we have someone <laughs> that is ours. So Philip uh, was kindly offered to come to give seminar on the inverters. Um, so I assume that most of the room know Philip. He was a very famous student here and graduated 2011 or 12, I Around 2011, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then got position in industry and from 2014 he is in the SMA. Uh, we usually meet in calls, very light in nights, but uh, we decided to change the venue and bring him here as a spray seminar. So, as you know, inverters become a very important part in the system, and SMA is definitely one of the leading in the world. And uh, we had, a few years ago, we had seminar from SMA, and we saw that it would be interesting to see what is new in this area. So, Philip, thank you very much for coming. It's great to have you back here. Thank you, Ziff. And please <laughs> Thank you everyone. So uh, it's my honor today to come back to uni and to provide a presentation to you. Uh, so in today's seminar, I'm going to go through the utility scale solution that uh, SMA has delivered in Australia in the last uh, two uh, and three years. So um, thanks to everyone's great work on the solar industry, we have made the uh, renewable energy especially for solar becomes more cheaper and affordable and uh, we start from the residential and commercial scale and now it's finally moved towards the utility scale. Um, so the images here are one of the sites we have delivered to the site and that's our team, field service team and with a large central inverter with the integrated solution including the medium voltage transformer and the switch gear. So um, if you have a chance to look at the solar farms at the Broken Hill or Ningen, that's back around five or six years ago, around that time that each inverter is rated around 800 kilowatt or one megawatt scale, and uh, they need to build a house to protect the inverter. You need to build your own transformer on site and integrated all the high voltage cables on site. It takes lots of labor and a very long construction time. And now we try to bring everything together. And of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, standards in Australia still quite new. And uh, today we're going to focus on the lessons learned in the last two years. So I'll quickly go through about the SMA Solar Technology. It's a German company that is one of the early pioneers to start in the solar inverter manufacturer to do the grid connection system for the residential house. Um, the inverter will start from 1.8 kilowatt and now uh, the latest product is 4.6 megawatt. In Australia we have so far delivering grid connected about more than 53 sites and about 800 um, central inverter has deployed around the world um, and also include a medium voltage platform. Um, and with lots of the people's help and also the government's policy support, and we can see a more and more solar integration into the grid. So let's have a look about the central inverters. Um, this is the DC cabinet. The cable entries is from the bottom. And then goes up to uh, lots of components in here. That's our DC cabinet. You need to have the fuse. You need to have the motorized DC circuit breakers. You need to have the cooling fans, surge arresters, uh, a lot of monitoring devices to make sure the device is protected uh, to prevent any DC arcs and also monitor the system's performance and also with the advanced monitoring solution, you can understand if your solar panels are performing at the right uh, current and the uh, voltage outputs. So with a different plan design and selection, we allow the customer to select at different DC inputs. And the fuse is quite large. It's rated from 200 amps all the way up to 630 amps. This is the real photo from the sites, from one of the sites. And um, as you can see, uh, that's uh, a lot of e components in there. 
a lot of customers will ask about the, uh, the cable entry location, um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, there's no glen plate, unlike the residential and commercial system usually comes with, with a glen plate. Uh, this is just only the metal bus bar. Of course, there's a red cover at the bottom between the DC cabinet and the cable entries. So in the outback in Australia, there are some potential um, animals and insects in the field. We have seen lots of spiders, snakes, um, we, we spot some dingoes and kangaroos, sometimes sheep around there. Uh, and it's important to make sure they are not going to those high DC voltage area. And when I say about high DC voltage, for all the utilities go in Australia, they all move on to 1,500 volt DC system. Okay. Um, now, to build a, a, a good solar farm and to make sure you can have a really good energy yield and can pay back um, around three or five years or with a good investment plan, it is very likely you will upsize your DC array according to what we have learned in the industry from America, from Australia, or from Europe. Therefore, that's a trend to put a bigger DC solar array next to your inverter. And also people might put the trackers to track the sun and you'll boost up your energy yield in early in the morning or late afternoon. Therefore, it becomes a challenge for the inverter manufacturer. You need to make sure the high current or high uh, DC voltage will not damage our IGBT or the DC protection equipment. Um, so oversizing becomes a, a very important thing to meet out your warranty guarantee. Um, so uh, we can provide up to 225% uh, DC to AC ratio. And for the overcurrent protection, we can go up to 6,400 uh, 6, amps. At early stage, we are building the solar farms um, without negative groundings. Um, so we're using the floating system design. That means um, we're putting the fuse on positive poles and negative poles. We're following the, our design concepts from the residential and commercial systems. But when you move on to the large utility scale, you series up your DC strings. Um, as a lot of solar plants start to operate three or four years later. They um, spotted out some issues. Uh, we call it potential um, induced degradation. Uh, a lot of solar panels start to perform poorly. Um, one of the solution for nowadays is to design your DC circuit arrays to use negative grounding. That means on your positive pole, we'll make on the DC voltage at maybe 1,400 volts and parallel your DC grounding bus bar with your negative pole. To, doing, to do this, you can make sure you don't need to worry about the PID issue on your solar array, but this can introduce a potential threat for the solar inverters and also for the people to walk into the solar fields. Um, that's the short circuit current. If this happens, let's say uh, 10 years later, the insulation layers of my solar panels or DC cablings get decayed, uh, got some, sh some short circuit, or maybe the snakes were tangling the cable or uh, some animals were chewing the cables, cause this short circuit current, uh, it is important to make sure the device can trip in time and not cause any damages or arcs to the machines and also the operators in the field. Therefore, it's important to have some de detection device. We put a ground fault detection and interruption devices on the grounding bus bar. And uh, this device, if it detects more than 5 amps DC current, uh, it will trip the uh, DC circuits and also shut down the inverters. And you will send a message to tell the operator to go to the site and investigate uh, what went wrong. This is something hasn't been considered into the Australian standard at the moment, but I think that's a very good practice that we can consider 
into the uh, Australian standards in the future. But it's very glad to see that most of the uh, engineering consulting firms has already adapted this from the US, from the Europe, in all the um, PV farms in Australia. Okay. Now, uh, next thing is the lightning protection. F uh, there's a lot of lightnings uh, in the field. Uh, also, it's important to protect your communication devices and also protect the solar arrays, these important expensive asset on site. Uh, therefore, uh, it's also important to consider how you protect these uh, heavy machinery uh, so we can add a lot of the uh, surge protectors into the device. Humidity management. There are some uh, sites are close to the coasts, especially there are some wind farms already exist uh, along the coasts and they want to utilize the grid connection point and expand with solar and perhaps the battery in the future. Now, um, around those geological location, the challenges for our equipment will be the high humidity. Therefore, it's important to add a humidity control equipment to make sure uh, every morning we heat up the air inside, uh, make sure the air is dry so uh, we don't damage our electrical components. Now let's move on, on to the uh, operation interface. So at the operation interface, we have the um, communication cabinet. So before, people need to bring their own communication cabinet in store externally. Now with a bigger inverter, we can integrate this inside of the inverter. We allow SCADA engineer to bring their own communication equipment uh, into the inverter, uh, also provide a nice power supply. On the right hand side, we have a nice um, a touch screen and the LED uh, light indicators. So let's have a close up look onto these touch screens and the indicators. Um, uh, from the different colors, it will tell you the status of the machine, the status of the grid, and the status of my solar panels. Down below, you'll see four buttons. Um, so these are connect, connected to the AC circuit breakers inside and DC circuit breakers inside of the inverter. Uh, it is quite uh, good design nowadays. Uh, most of the inverter manufacturers has this. Uh, this is because according to the IEC new standards. So what happens before is um, people need to open the cabinet and with a, well, with a full protection and turn on and off of the DC switch gears uh, to shut down the inverters and then start to do the maintenance. That's quite dangerous and scary. If there's an arc, if there's an uh, insects fly into these live components, uh, not only uh, could damage the components, but could also potentially harm the person to service the machine. Now, uh, it is very important to de-energize ma the machines before we open the cabinet and start to service these uh, uh, solar inverters. Now, this, there's some images about what it looks like and some screenshots about the touch screen display. Um, and these are the locations that shows where the AC DC circuit breakers are and the power supply. We also allow customer to add power quality meters. Um, usually the utility companies are care about the quali power, power qualities waveform outputs. They care about your harmonics level, what's your frequency control capability, what's your over voltage, lower voltage protection, what's your um, um, other um, power quality output. So um, this space allows the customer to add these meters. Um, and also for AMO's requirement, they have some uh, testing requirements in here. So we have the nice package to meet up their uh, requirement. Um, of course, for other part of the world, usually it's for the SCADA engineers to add the equipment to monitor um, other stuff. For example, I have a weather station I want to understand the temperature um, 
around the inverter or I want to know the temperature of my solar panel, I can add some PT100 sensor and connects to the inverter. Everything can link back and try to simplify all the components on site. This is what it looks like inside of the inverter. It has a, a data logger with the power supply, include the DC buffer. Now, um, a lot of people design a PV plant, focus on the solar arrays and the DC cable layout and AC cable layout. They forgot a very important part, which is the SCADA uh, system. Um, it's very different compared to residential and commercial system. Uh, the point of connection for utility scale usually is at 132 kV or 66 kV at a high voltage connection point. In a large utility scale solar farm, the inverters are scattered into the field. That usually, usually they are kilometers away to the point of connection. Therefore, it's very important you put a, a, a power quality meter to measure the voltage and fre frequency fluctuation. And also you add a computer there, a PLC, to calculate the deviation of the voltage and the frequency and also the power factor and tell all the inverter how to respond to that point. So unlike the residential and commercial, we can put the grid connection code inside of the inverter and they can respond at the inverter output terminal. But for utility scales, we cannot wait until the inverter low voltage output terminal to respond uh, on the fluctuation. Uh, we need to make sure everyone is synchronized and respond to the same point. Uh, that's usually we, we see in, the, in this industry, they uh, forget to plan in the early stage and leave it to the very last minute. Um, let's have a look on the AC side. After the IGBT, we have transformed that into a nice sine wave AC output. And it's very important to make sure you have a nice cooling strategy method to cool down your uh, inverters. And at the bottom, that's most heaviest components. We have the chalk um, to smooth your sine wave output and the AC contactors. That's my AC bus bar output. And you will connect to my step up transformer. You will boost up the AC voltage up to 11 kV, 22 kV, or Thank you, Siri, but <laughs> 11 kV, 22 kV to 33 kV. So what's a medium voltage? Uh, so anything for 6.6 kV all the way up to 40.5 kV, this range, we call it a medium voltage. Um, so uh, usually in the solar farm, uh, we need to boost up the voltage level. And in the solar farm, we are connected in the transmission lines or so higher distribution network. Okay, so a lot of people might ask about how we do the cooling. A different manufacturer has a different strategies and method. People might use water coolings and uh, air coolings. Uh, SMA is using the air cooling uh, and uses its own patent to um, make sure it can um, be reliable in the Australian outback environment. This is a real image of what it looks like on the AC uh, chamber. It's also um, important to look at on my AC circuit breakers when you try to shut, shut down the system. Um, this is an example about the um, uh, earlier stage of the solar industry where people are not looking closely enough on the AC circuit breakers protection, especially on the arc. Um, and for SMA, we have a, a close-up look and make sure it is important to have this uh, arc protection. And later on, this has been adapted in the IEC standards. And again, um, it is very important that Australia can look this kind of arc flash protection uh, into the standards as well. Okay. Um, so uh, also for the backup protection, uh, in Australia, we have different utility across different states. Uh, they ask uh, some uh, inquiries 
for the inverter to have a capability to shut down if they want to do maintenance at upper stream. So uh, that's another feature that we can offer to the customer. So now uh, the biggest inverter that we are offering to the market is 4.6 megawatt. Uh, we're making bigger and bigger in inverters. I believe uh, with everyone's work, we're making bigger and bigger solar cells and bigger and bigger solar panels. So how big will that be, become more affordable and uh, achievable uh, to hit the renewable energy target? That's something we're all trying to, to figure out. And there are some major components for the solar inverter to decide the future size of the, the inverter. That includes uh, power stacks, the IGBT, the size of the sine wave filter, the size of the cabinet, how we do the cooling, and also the energy management control, how we interact with the uh, power grid. Okay, that's for the inverter. So I'm going to move on to the integrated solution. That means with my transformer, medium voltage switch gear, and some SCADA. So in front of you, that's the uh, image of Ganawara Solar Farm um, supplied by Arena. Um, and nowadays, the uh, delivery time for a solar farm is around uh, one year to uh, 15 months. It's very short. Um, uh, therefore, they want uh, the, the industry want an integrated solution um, so they can do a fast uh, deploy to the site and they can very easy to do a plugging and play solution. Um, SMA has teamed up with a local supplier, um, which is a Wilson Company. Uh, so they're located in Wodonga. Um, what they, what they make is a medium voltage transformer and uh, also we integrate it with a switch gear. So in here, um, as you can see, there's a transformer here and there's a switch gear on the um, uh, skid platform. The transformer is hermetically sealed oil transformer. Uh, currently is with mineral oil. The idea is just to do the cooling um, also, we need to make sure these oil transformers are cooled down properly. Uh, so we need to have the temperature sensor to monitor its performance. We need to have the pressure and the oil sensor to make sure it won't explode. Um, and on the HV output, that's the uh, medium voltage switch gear. In terms of the single line diagram, it looks like this. Uh, and uh, also it comes with the LV auxiliary power transformer that usually powers the uh, weather station or on-site uh, loads for the customer. Let's have a look about what's inside of the skid platform. Um, people might put the cables inside in here. So compared to the, the, the concrete roof that previously we, we were deliver, that human would deliver, to the solar farms in Europe, to America or Australia, this has uh, been simplified and compact solution. Um, okay, so this just try to give you an idea about what the, uh, the products we have been used in the industry in the last two years. And this is the switch gear with the uh, circuit breaker and two low breaker switch. Uh, that's the LV circuit breakers. Uh, and in the distribution panel and the LV auxiliary transformer. So now we can make a 40 foot skid. Um, we parallel two inverters and make a six megawatt uh, skid solution um, and share with one transformer on a platform. And again, um, everything will be pre-wired and integrated and sent to the site. Besides the solution we provide in Australia, we also got a containerized solution that delivered to the world. Um, so um, for the large utility scale, we are providing around 500 kilowatts and all the way up to six megawatt solution currently um, at the moment. Um, by doing this, we can save a lot of labor costs and sh shipping costs. Um, 
But at the moment, uh, there's not much standards around this new products and new features. And we're trying to add what we have known from the uh, medium voltage or high voltage standards onto these devices, especially in Australia. So we try to use a very critical uh, point of view to examine these kind of product. So sometimes uh, people are applying the building codes into these containers. Uh, so they are asked well, we to add some uh, smoke alarms and the emergency fast stop. Um, so one of the important features is the um, arc flash protection at the medium voltage switch gear. So let me show you an example about arc flash. At the circuit breaker, so without the proper protections and with manual operation to switch off the switch gear, this could happen. So especially when the switch gear are out of its warranty, more than three years or five years, and they couldn't break within 30 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, or there's a carbon context around the surface. And the arc with such a large energy could cause this issue. And it's very important that you adopt the right design, right, um, uh, right standard to make sure uh, the operator can walk into the field and go home safely. So let's have a look about the proper design um, with the proper internal arc flash protection, you can make sure with the right gas chamber, uh, you can save not only the human life, but also uh, the other equipment. So if this thing happens, your transformer and your inverters can be safe. Right? Um, and th that's quite important uh, that uh, in Australia we could adopt the, these kind of the features uh, not only for solar, but also for other renewable uh, equipment as well. Um, so for, for the future, uh, I think it's still bright for all of us. Um, there's certainly there's a strong need for the renewable energy, um, not only for residential and commercial, but also for utility scale. Um, but, at, but at the moment, there's too much energy in certain areas, in certain grid, uh, therefore, it's very important to use the right strategy and method to stabilize the grid voltage, grid frequency, and power factor. Um, energy storage could be one of the solution. And um, with that, uh, we can add more uh, renewable solutions to it. Um, okay, so any question? Yes, please. Thanks, that was really good. Uh, Philip, um, so you mentioned that you need to be able to handle a DC to AC ratio of over 200%, which seems quite extraordinarily high. What typically do people do these days, and do you see that the trend is increasing? So it depends on the financial investment models. In the US, it is quite likely to go up to 200% because they are focused on the level of cost of electricity. That means I'm checking out how much kilowatt hour um, I'm paying for the, for the solar farm over 20 years time. So it's pretty much like how we check the power bills. We check how much kilowatt hours we're paying, right? So with a bigger DC arrays, you're guaranteed to have a bigger yield with less AC equipment, less transformers, less AC circuit breakers. So you just by increasing your DC panels. And it's important for the inverter to control that DC input, not damaging your AC equipment and minimize your fu future maintenance and spare parts consumptions. Yes. So just a, a follow-on from that, Phil, thanks very much for your talk. So it, it would seem that therefore the DC side of the cost equation, the panels are cheap and 
you want to maximize the value out of your whole system. So just 200% over, well, 100% over capacity, you're happy to spill a lot of DC power uh, and just maximize the return on your investment for the rest of the uh, solar farm. Is, is that a? That's a trend in America, yeah. for sure, uh, for their investment model by considering the, about the feeding tariffs, the interest rates and the tax. Um, and also they put a trackers so you can see how much they want to add into the DC yield. Um, so that, that, that defines their DC to AC ratio. And also the 200% uh, percent is for the utility scale. For the equipment that SMA has for residential and commercial is only up to 150%. So back to Australia utility scale, the um, AEMO has a different inquiries here. They want the, all the solar inverter to have a capability to perform reactive power control. That means if the grid power, uh, grid voltage is too high, the inverter should absorb the reac reactive current. If the grid voltage is too low, I want the inverter, to, I want the inverter to inject reactive current. For every 100 megawatt, I want you to put about 30 megavar capacity in there. Therefore, with this kind of inquiry, we're bringing down the DC to AC ratio. So the DC to AC, AC ratio that you mentioned in America, purely just on the active power to active power ratio in, in, on the equation. But in, in Australia, we're more talking about kilowatt on the DC side, but KVA on the AC side. So maybe the DC to AC ratio doesn't really make any sense, financial sense in Australia for, for the utility scale. Yeah. Oliver? I've got a question. Thanks for the very nice talk. So in your last slide, you had a very aggressive growth uh, rate for utility scale uh, PV in Australia. Uh, what do you think could be the obstacles for this? I mean, we see residential is kind of more or less doubling maybe from where we are now to 2040, but utility goes up quite substantially. So what do you think could be the issues that you're facing with this very high growth rate that you are foreseeing? I mean, yeah. So um, the, the forecast is based on the, the uh, scenario where the coal-fired uh, power station need to retire. Once they retire, there's a gap uh, in terms of gigawatts uh, need to be covered, right? And there's a lot of forms of energy generation available in the market. And I believe solar will be one of them to cover the gap, especially for the daytime. But for the nighttime, maybe their wind, maybe their energy storage, hydrogen, new technology, or something we don't know yet, to cover the next few years. Yeah. I think this is an AEMO uh, graphic from their report. Correct. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <coughs> so that's, so that's their estimation of what's going to have to happen to meet the shutdown of coal plants, which is already scheduled. Yeah. yeah. So they've got a, a few different scenarios. Uh, so I haven't got the glasses, but I think there's a few different ones. Some are more aggressive on solar, some are less. I'm just wondering, one of the things that we hear is that, that connecting large power to the grid, you know, the grid can't always support that. There's a lot of sites where, you know, you have to put in like new wires or like big transformers and things like that. Do you see that that could be a potential issue? Could be, especially some area has a lot of weak grids, Le less population density. You know, um, we don't know why people want to build solar farms that's far away where people need it. We, we need to boost, boost up the power voltage and transmit all the way, and there's some cable losses to where we are. But I think that's uh, the way we do the business investment, because the land is cheaper there, maybe. You know, um, but um, building the new lines or adding a new substation will add a wider, I'll say, let's use a metaphor, you will add a wider road for more cars 
so you have less traffic, right? So you don't need to worry about the voltage fluctuation, power quality issues at the moment. I think, yeah, my personal opinion would be like, that's part of the challenges we are facing with the population growth, not only in this country, but anywhere in the world. Yeah. Is there a special consideration for the inverters for thin film modules, for example, CRGS modules? Because they usually have a, a very small current but very large voltage. So um, for thin film modules, um, the one that using Lingen solar farms and Broken Hill solar farms are uh, using first solar thin film modules. Um, as long as the current and the voltage do not exceed the protection requirements, there's no any issue with uh, the power transformers or the inverters. Yeah. Yes, Alastair. Phil, thanks very much again. The um, intrigued, I mean, I guess the Australian outback is a challenging environment. Um, you were showing some cooling systems and air cooling. Um, yes. In terms of, have you got a feeling, I mean, I guess they've got to bring, um, oh, I, I, you don't need to bring fresh air in. Is there any connection? Is there? We're bringing fresh air in. So let me go to more details about these two slides. So um, we're using a patent uh, technology called OptiCool. Um, this patent was also used for other cooling uh, machinery, maybe laptop or uh, fridge, but we, we use this patent for our inverter. From the Sony Boy, Sony Tripower, and also for Sony Central to do the thermal dynamics calculation. So we bring the cool airs from the external environment and imagine this inverter is like a sandwich. You have the DC cabinet, air channels, and the DC cabinets. So we bring the cool airs, try to blow in and cool down the heat sinks at the back of two chambers. Now, um, and uh, the hot air is blowing from the bottom, right? This is slightly different to what we learn from physics. We usually think the hot, hot air is go always goes to the top and build chimney. Um, the reason we're doing this is because um, if we bring the cool air from the bottom, it's very easy to suck in the dusts and also the, some leaves Therefore, you need to ha have a frequent maintenance on the filter. So by doing this way, we, uh, and use a bigger fans, you can largely reduce the maintenance time and the costs, and still provide a good uh, method to cool down the whole system. And um, of course, the important um, electrical components are sealed properly with a, a accurate IP rating. So they are sealed properly with IP65, the air duct channels are um, uh, in the IP34. So they do some heat exchange with the external uh, environment. And the heat sensors is at the air inlet. Of course, the inverter will derate its output uh, about 10%, start from 35 degrees all the way to 50. So if we sense the external air temperature is about 50 degrees Celsius, maybe the earth is burning, but uh, the AC output would reduce about 10%. Yeah. Just to follow up, yeah, so it seems to me you're going to have a lot of interesting challenges with um, dust. Uh, so I'm, I'm intrigued that you, maybe I'll chat to you later, I'm intrigued that you've gone for a um, fresh air system uh, because I would have thought you could have handled it internally, just chilled, co cooled the air down internally. Uh, but without bringing in fresh air, but... Um. It was. For our previous model, for SMA's previous model, it was a uh, major challenges, um, and especially the one that we installed in Hawaii um, had a lot of issues before we introduced the outdoor central inverters. We used to do the indoor central inverters back at that time. It's around 250 kilowatts and put on the floor like a fridge. Um, and after that, the R&D improves a lot to reach to that stage. So the latest reference in the last four years, we can put these machines into the Arizona desert or the desert in the Middle East. 
without any issues. But we can discuss more later on after this. Yeah, I'm just intrigued yeah. as to how often someone has to go out and change the dust filters. This, uh, this, uh, um, according to the manual, is once a year. Uh, and there's a white paper I'm happy to share with you okay. and with the academy. <laughs> Thanks. So maybe I, I want to follow what Alistair asked, because a few times you mentioned that Australia is different. So do you have R&D here that try to take the inverters and uh, develop technology that's more suitable to the Australian market? So that's the first one. And the second, you mentioned a lot of time that there is lack of standard in Australia. So I just wonder about how it's work or if there is any communication between you and the body that put the standard about what is missing and how much influence there is to companies with knowledge like you about what is the standard need to be? Mm, so we have proper application engineers and product managers and collect the uh, information from those markets or from different markets lo uh, locally and feeds back to, to Germany. The R&D is centralized in Germany and uh, the product manager will constantly have a, a, a WebEx, the online conference with us, and to understand what's the requirements. Is it from the utility? Is it from the grid? Is it on the power control? Uh, is it for the safety inquiries? Is it for the environment protection? Is it really necessary for uh, extreme environment protection, let's say for earthquake? Um, uh, those kind of things. Is it in important to have a fire protection to an extreme level, like assume it's people live in the container, for example. Um, and especially for Australia, still try to learn and pick up for the utility scale. Um, for SMA, we have uh, learned a lot from the US market and the, the Europe market. And when we look at the IEC standards, usually is more developed compared to the Australian standards. A lot of the uh, standards will refer to AS5033 or AS4777, but if you look at closely, it's only up to 200 kilowatt commercial system and only up to 1,000 volt DC system. It's not really applicable for 1,500 volt DC system, but that's the closest you can get. Um, therefore, it's very interesting to to um, to help the industry to build out a, a more proper standard and less noise when we deploy these uh, projects. Um, and I think maybe um, through this chance we can just share the, the lessons learned and discuss uh, a better standard in the future if it's possible for Australia. And maybe it's easier for us, all of us, to make a utility skill solar happen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, just on the trying to understand the kind of the scale of installs Australia grid level for Australia versus other parts of the world. Because I was in the US recently and was looking at their residential cost at least for solar, and it's far higher than Australia. So I know Australia is one of the cheapest places to put solar on residentially. Is it one of the cheapest places to put solar on? for grid scale and what percentage of the kind of the world's solar is being installed in Australia at the moment? For, for, for the residential and commercial, I agree with you. In Australia, what we're the one of the most affordable in the world. For the utility scale, uh, it's really project case by case. Um, and also it involves with a lot of grid study um, and planning stage and also uh, a lot of uh, substation or high, high, uh, high voltage infrastructures you need to consider. It. And uh, also maybe you need to pave the road and build other infrastructure. Therefore, it becomes harder to, to compare uh, in terms of how to, you know, the price comparison to build a solar farms, not only in Australia, but compared to around the world. I think it's more like case by case. Maybe you can compare about how much it costs on the trackers and the s solar arrays or on the transformers um, directly, but just by comparing the, the, the sites will be a range to a range, but doesn't 
really make a, a meaningful sense at the moment. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you're currently the largest uh, inverter that you have is somewhere more than four megawatts. So do you see the industry going to bigger and bigger central inverters or do you think it will plateau off eventually at say at four or some, uh, some higher number? At the moment the trend is going bigger and cheaper, same as the solar panel. <laughs> so um, that's all the way we're going for the utility scale and also for the DC voltage. So um, I, I've, yeah, so uh, we have learned from 600 volts to 1,000 volts and now move on to 1,500 volts. Yeah. Yep, so you mentioned that um, uh, AEMO wants you to control reactive power, um, but there's also been um, talk about um, needing more synchronous generation to control the frequency. Can these inverters help stabilize the frequency and can, a, can these large solar farms actually make a big difference in that, in that area? So um, the answer is yes and no. Yes means it can to a certain level. Depends how many inverters you have purchased until its maximum capacity. Um, and depends how much the grid is required to fulfill the load's requirement also the, the re requirements for the, the power lines to stabilize all the frequencies and the voltage fluctuation. If the existing equipments around the power line cannot um, supply enough reactive power to stabilize the current situation, then extra equipment is required to stabilize the um, the power quality. Yes. So maybe and I know, like we focus on central inverters. Do you, is string inverters become popular, or is it something that you think that will become popular? String inverters is also popular um, to convert from DC to AC. Um, we have seen this in the uh, different markets as well especially for those countries where the utility uh, has defined the grid code uh, for utility scale. Let's say in the US, they have defined the UL1741, even up to the utility scale. It's very easy to use the string inverters for the large utility scale. And we have seen this for the European countries as well. Um, but for in Australia, we, we do not have a grid code for large utility scale. That's why you need to do a grid study. SMA or any other inverter manufacturer need to provide the inverter control parameter to this grid study consultant. For each project, they need to play around the, those parameters running in the software called PSSE and PSCAD and find out what's the best um, grid connection code for these projects with this inverter to connect it to the grid. They submit to AEMO to review, and AEMO check with the latest national electric rules requirement and see, okay, have you achieved the automatic access standard? Or if you're not, are you achieving the negotiated standard or the minimum requirements? And uh, they'll come back to the developers and grid study consultants Yes, your proof or no, unfortunately, you need to improve your grid study code, you know, back forward. But other countries, they just do a test certificate, like how we regulate the residential and commercial systems. We, we do a test certificate. Are you passing the AS4777? And CEC will put, yes, it's on the list. It's listed. And then every inverter has an existing grid connection code. And some utility that's in California, they will do a grid study. The, the utility will do a grid study. They will tell you, I don't care how big the land it is, but this power line can only take this much of energy with this existing grid, grid code. So in terms of the process, it becomes more simplified, right? And uh, in the process, it's much more easier. Yeah. 
Oliver, still, last question? Yeah, I've got a question that goes in a bit in the direction of what Nathan asked. So at the moment, battery is kind of a big buzz, right, for, for homes, but also like we've seen the horn horns sale battery and uh, like the Tesla battery. Are you also planning to integrate like battery storage in, in projects or do you already mm -hmm. sort of think strategically in that direction or is that something that you think is, is not required? Or, I mean, what's your thinking generally on, on batteries for large scale utility solar? So for a large scale, um, I think it's necessary to uh, use the storage to use it as part of the tools to stabilize the, the grid. Um, so for this part, at least I agree with, uh, the, with the AEMO. But at the moment, the, they're still working on the standards and regulations, how the batteries and the generator or the inverter should um, work together with all kinds of generators in terms of the PSSC simulation, PSCAS simulations, um, and stabilize all the grid at the moment. So that's that's that, that's where we at at the moment. Yes, you will be in the future, but um, not until everything's are set. Yeah, and when that's set, I think the f you will attract the people starting invests and to bring it in. But in terms of technology, we are ready. <laughs> And we have de de deployed a lot of solutions in Tonga, in US, and in Germany, and in Europe. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if you wish to last after us. So maybe let's thank uh, Philip again oh. for such a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.